This video is sponsored by Noom. Find the link in the description below. We all know that we need to be drinking water, but why do we need to be drinking water? What makes it so important? What does the body even do with it? And what happens to the body when you don't have enough of it? Are these simple questions? Maybe. But they're important questions that everyone should have the answers to. And in today's video, we're gonna use the cadavers to take a look at what happens to water once it enters into the body through the digestive system. We'll see how the brain even understands that you need more or less water, how the kidneys respond to the brain's instructions, and we'll even see what happens to cells when they have too much, too little, or just the right amount of water. It's gonna be a fun one. Let's do this. Thirst occurs when there's a need for an organism, such as you, to find and consume water. As you probably already know, without water, you die within a few days, depending on the exact circumstance. I mean, if you're in the Sahara Desert with no protection from the elements, you're likely to die a whole lot quicker than you would if you were in other environments. But all in all, you tend to die within a few days. In contrast, humans can survive without food for weeks to months at a time, again, depending on the exact circumstances. Water is just very, very important. And you find it in two places in the body. You can find it inside of the cells, or what we call the intracellular space, or you can find it outside of the cells, in what we call the extracellular space. Roughly two thirds of your total water volume is going to be located in the intracellular space, meaning most of your water is gonna be in the cells of your brain, your heart, your lungs, your kidneys, so on and so forth. The remaining one third will be found outside of your cells. So think like your connective tissues. Now this means, depending on the type of dehydration you're experiencing, you could actually experience different types of thirst. An intracellular thirst or an extracellular thirst. Let's say that if your cells become dehydrated, oftentimes simply drinking water can be enough to replenish them. However, if you lose blood, because blood contains water, let's say you get a cut on your arm, that could mean that you'd need water and salt to help regenerate the blood at its correct concentrations. This could mean you might need a meal to go with your water to fully quench your thirst, although I'm not entirely sure that's the best way to describe it. You might be wondering how much water you should be drinking per day. That's actually a little more difficult to answer than you may think, and that's because it depends on a variety of factors. What altitude do you live at, believe it or not? Um, how old are you? Are you menstruating? Do you consume alcohol? How physically active are you? The list goes on and on. And while these are all important questions to ask, I personally don't find them necessary to ask in the beginning. Instead, you wanna focus on building the habit of drinking water to start off with, and then start to dial in the exact amount you need for you as a person based on your individual circumstances. But that's true of health and wellness in general. If you wanna make an overall improvement in your health, well, first you need to educate yourself as to why it's actually important and a good idea to make that improvement, and then you need to build a healthy habit off of that, and then you can even start to expand later on down the road. It's, to me, undeniably the best way to go. That's why I love the sponsor of today's video, Noom. I've been using Noom for a little over a month now, and I am head over heels for it, and the reason is super simple. It's not your run-of-the-mill fitness tracker. It's so much more than that. I mean, yes, it does do what those other fitness trackers you've seen do. It counts your calories, it tracks your steps and your body weight, but it does something else on top of that that is so vitally important and I see no one else doing it. It educates you on why tracking those things are actually important. And it does that through articles and lessons, which are super short, by the way. You can easily get through your daily articles and lessons in less than 10 minutes. On top of that, with Noom, you get your own goal specialist that's trained in psychology, nutrition, and fitness to help guide you through this educational journey that you're going on. And the crazy part is they're a real person. I tested this because I didn't believe it at first. I was like, you know, maybe they just say it's a real person, but it's really an artificial intelligence. So what I did is I got in contact with my goal specialist and I was like, I'm Justin from the Institute of Human Anatomy and I kind of told them how I was gonna be doing this very sponsored post. And I asked them, do you have anything you wanted to share with me? Maybe like your experiences working with people as a goal specialist or feel free, whatever. And I got this huge response just being like, this is so cool, your content is amazing, and then listed off all these things, these success stories, tips, tricks, and I'm just sitting there like, this is amazing. They genuinely, genuinely wanna help you. Numa's special because they're doing the only thing that I've personally found to work long term. Build better habits better sleep habits, fitness habits, eating habits, right? It's not about fad dieting or fad exercises. 
And the thing is, they do it all without shaming you. I mean, if you miss a weigh-in or maybe you don't read all your articles or blogs, instead of shaming you, your goal specialist will just contact you and say, hey, what's going on? Is there anything I can do to help? Is there anything you need? I mean, it's, it's really humanizing and just says, you know what, look, we all make mistakes. We all have slip ups. What can I do to actually help? If you're interested, click the link in the description below or you just visit noom.com slash human anatomy and take your free Noom evaluation today. It's quick, it's easy, and it's the first step in building better overall health habits. Now, let's go ahead and jump over to a cadaver section of the brain and see just how the body monitors hydration levels. You're looking at a mid-sagittal cross section of the human head, meaning we've cut it right down the middle. So to quickly orient you so you know what you're looking at, this is the anterior direction. This is going to be the nose. This is that nasal septum. And then we're heading in the posterior direction. And this really cool looking structure here is called the cerebellum. And then right in front of it is the brainstem. But our focus today is going to be in this little region right here. So specifically what I'm tracing with my probe is a region called the hypothalamus. And then just below the hypothalamus is a really fascinating gland called the pituitary gland. Now, both of these structures together form what you can think of as like a bridge between the neurological or nervous system, like the brain that I'm touching with the probe here, and your glandular hormonal endocrine system, like the adrenal glands, for instance. So these two structures together form a bridge. And what's gonna happen is the hypothalamus is going to communicate with the pituitary gland, and then that pituitary gland will start sending out signals. Now, the messages it's communicating are typically based around something called homeostasis. So you can think of homeostasis as your body's natural balance or you know, as close to being balanced as possible. And the hypothalamus job is to try and bring the body back to homeostasis or at times actually bring it away from homeostasis. It really depends on the circumstance. But a real easy thing to wrap your mind around would be like body temperature, which is about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or I think it's 36 to 37 degrees Celsius. I forget which one it is. But the body or the hypothalamus will deviate from that based on demand. So maybe say if you're hot, then it will recognize that as you're going above that temperature and it will start to initiate sweating to help bring you to cool down. Well, what goes with that homeostasis is going to be water regulation. Now, the term we're actually gonna use here is osmoregulation. Now, to understand what that means, we first need to discuss something called osmosis. Simply put, osmosis is the diffusion or movement of water from one area to another based around electrolyte concentration. Now you've probably heard of electrolytes before, it's probably in sports drinks, but these are gonna be things like sodium, chloride, potassium, to name a few, and they are all over the body. They are extremely important for cellular function and just performance, and in this instance, they are essential for monitoring and regulating hydration levels. So, inside of the hypothalamus, which again is going to be this region right here, there are going to be cells in there called osmoreceptors, which are, that's probably gonna make a lot of sense to you. Osmo in this instance is for osmosis. Now, these osmoreceptors are actually stretch sensitive neurons. And what happens is they are capable of actually determining how much water and how much electrolytes are overall in the body based around how, many, how much water and electrolytes are inside of them. So think about it like this. If there is not enough water, those osmoreceptors will actually shrink, and that will send a signal down to this area right here called the posterior pituitary and tell it to secrete a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. You've probably heard of diuretics before. A diuretic is something that causes you to urinate. So an antidiuretic hormone would cause you to not urinate or retain your water. So if you don't have enough water, it makes sense to not urinate, you don't wanna lose anymore, so what will happen is that will go down to the kidneys and say, hey, let's not urinate. But let's say you have too much water. That would then cause those osmoreceptors to start to swell, right? They start to bloat, and that itself would also send a signal down to this posterior pituitary and say, hey, make less antidiuretic hormone because if you make less of it, then obviously you're going to urinate more and you can start to lose water. It's all about balance. Remember, it goes back to that term that we just mentioned, homeostasis. Now, osmoreceptors aren't the only ones in the body monitoring hydration levels. In fact, they belong to a larger regulatory pathway called osmoregulation. One other example of neurons that are osmoregulatory 
are what are called baroreceptors. These are gonna be located inside of blood vessels, specifically arteries like the aorta, which is gonna be coming out from the heart, and they are monitoring blood pressure. So I mean, picture this, right? There's water in your blood, so if you have too much water in the bloodstream, that's going to elevate blood pressure. And these baroreceptors are also stretch sensitive, and they are going to detect that, and they are then going to initiate a series of events that is going to be osmoregulative. At the same time, let's say maybe you get cut. I don't know, maybe like in the knee or something along those lines and you're bleeding. Well, you are now losing water. And so what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a slight decrease in blood pressure. Those baroreceptors are also going to sense that. And once again, they are gonna become osmoregulative. You're looking at a kidney that's been cut in the frontal or coronal plane, which means it's been divided into front and back portions. Now I'm gonna give you a quick tour of the kidney because there's a lot to look at here. So this is called the renal artery. And what it does is it brings unfiltered blood to the kidney because that's what the kidney does. It filters your blood. And this renal artery is going to start splitting and it splits many different times until eventually these tiny little blood vessels get to this outer rim, which you can see this distance here is called the renal cortex. This is where all the really interesting stuff happens inside of the kidney. And that's because there are these tiny little filtration units located in here that we can't see, which are called nephrons. They're going to filter the blood, and then that newly filtered blood will basically take the same return, return trip, except instead of going in the arterial system, it's going to go in the venous system, which is, if I can grab it, that's this one behind it right there. Now, when it filters uh, the waste out, it's going to drop it into this darkened uh, inner core of the kidney. This region here is called the renal medulla. And the renal medulla is made up of these individual renal pyramids. That's what all these darkened portions are. The renal pyramids are basically just made up of all these little tubes. And what will happen is the waste product will drop into the collecting tubes and then go down into the urinary tract. And that's what you're seeing here, which will eventually go down to like the ureter and then down to the bladder. Now, in terms of osmoregulation, that is going to occur here in that renal medulla. So what you have to understand is that the tissue of the kidney itself is going to be naturally salty. It's gonna have a bunch of uh, sodium and chloride inside of there, and that is going to attract water. So, just think about it like this. If you have too much water, what will happen is the kidney will actually put the salt into the collecting tubes, and that will attract water into those renal pyramids, and then you will urinate out the excess water. Now, if you are dehydrated, what will happen is that salt will move into the more so into the kidney tissue and the water will come with it. So the water will go into the tissue of the kidney, which will then find other accessory blood vessels and be returned to the body. So you can think of all of the osmoregulation of the kidney happening here in that renal medulla. So what does dehydration do to the body? Well, it depends on, again, the type of dehydration that's happening to you. Remember, blood loss actually is a form of dehydration. And with enough blood loss, you have some pretty severe problems on your hand. But it also might be important to discuss how, the, the different ways you can lose water to begin with, because you don't just lose water through urination. You lose water through breathing and speaking, through crying, through sweating. And it's not just water you're losing in these instances either. You're also going to be losing electrolytes. Remember, those salts are what attract water to it. And so in order to get rid of the water, you're also going to be getting rid of some of those electrolytes, which is going to definitely uh, alter and affect your that osmoregulation pathway. So it depends on the form of dehydration. Are you just dehydrated from water? Are you just dehydrated from electrolytes? Or is it both? And in what amounts? But in the end, it's going to affect the performance of the cells, the individual cells themselves. How much is it gonna affect their performance? Again, it also depends, right? I mean, just think about the common symptoms you see with dehydration. Headache, uh, dry mouth, lips, eyes. You can get a darker color of urine. I'm sure you've all seen that, where that's because there's a high, there's, when there's less water content in the urine, and there's a higher density of other things, it just tends to look darker. But you're also gonna get confusion. You'll get fatigue. And the worse the dehydration gets, the worse these symptoms will get to the point where it's not just confusion in the late stages of dehydration, it's borderline delirium to the point where you're psychotic. So what's happening to the body? Essentially, you're just dying. And you're dying very slowly in the initial stages and then you're dying very quickly in those later stages. 
Thanks again to the sponsor of today's video, Noom. Be sure to click the link in the description below and take their quick and easy free evaluation and you can start building better health habits today. As always, be sure to like, comment, subscribe if you haven't already, and just good luck hydrating out there, folks. Be sure to consume electrolytes on top of that water to optimize these hydration levels, and I will see you in the next video.